Welcome to Decision Analyst Insider Series webinar on the exploration of facial action coding, the wild animal experiment. My name is Christy Allen. I am the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the moderator today. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few notes for everyone. There is a copy of today's presentation in the handouts section available for everyone to download. Also, please feel free to ask questions by typing in the chat box. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenters are Dr. A.T. Krant, Consumer Neuroscientist from Applied Neural Knowledge. Dr. Grant has a background in cognitive psychology and brain research concentrating on visual information processing, particularly FACES. And Jerry Thomas, President and CEO of Decision Analyst, is co-presenting. Jerry has served as a research and analytic consultant to major companies and advertising agencies. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jerry. Thank you, Christy, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on facial coding and the wild animal experiment. Uh, my co-presenter will be Dr. A.T. Grant, who's a neuroscientist in the U.S. and a consultant to decision analyst and other major corporations. So this is uh, very uh, interesting. We hope that you will enjoy the presentation. Uh, just a bit of background before we get into to the results. Um, Facial expressions are largely controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And we can think about there are two systems at work. One is the system of macro expression, and these are the facial expressions that we typically see when we're talking and interacting with people. The other system are micro expressions, and these are very quick expressions that are totally controlled by the autonomic nervous system and we're generally not aware of these movements of the face because they happen so fast. Uh, these micro expressions occur in one-fifth of a second, sometimes as quickly as one twenty-fifth of a second. And it's these micro expressions that we will see in a moment that drive uh, facial coding. And of course it's uh, well known that our faces are a window into our inner self, into our emotions such as joy and anger and disgust and surprise and fear. And humans are unaware, we are unaware of our facial micro expressions or micro responses and the emotions they reveal. As I mentioned, we're aware of the, of the macro, the big, large movements of our face, but not the small movements that are more directly wired to our unconscious or to our involuntary uh, autonomic nervous system. One definition before we get into the heart of the presentation, and that's the term facial action coding or FAC and it involves observing faces and assigning codes for emotions revealed by facial micro expressions. So face, facial action coding or FAC is driven by these almost instantaneous uh, micro expressions that we're largely unaware of as we go about interacting with people. And we'll use this term FAC over and over in the presentation and that's what we're referring to. Just a brief bit of history. Uh, facial coding is not new. The first, uh, it, it traces back actually to the early 1800s, but the first major scientific work was a book written by Charles Darwin in 1872 uh, titled something uh, close to the expression of emotion in man and animals. Um, and he wrote a complete book on the similarity of facial expressions across different 
primates. So Charles Darwin of uh, evolution fame really was the uh, person who gave impetus to facial expressions as a link to our emotions. About a hundred years later in the 1970s, uh, professors Paul Ekman and Wallace Friesen at the University of San Francisco began a more formal study of facial coding and began to develop formalized systems uh, to code faces and especially the micro expressions that we talked about and they gave it the the name facial action coding or FAC. The problem with that particular um, approach was it was very very labor intensive and it took highly trained uh, individuals to go in and laboriously and tediously code frame by frame the faces of, um, of the participants. So it wasn't very practical from that standpoint. But by the late 90s, advances in cameras and sensors and computers and software made it possible to automate facial coding. In 2009, Effectivo, uh, one of the leaders in LFAC, uh, began its work and thanks to Effectiva for uh, collaborating with us on this uh, project. They did all of the, uh, uh, ran, ran all of the uh, pictures and results that we're going to discuss through their uh, automated coding systems. The promise of co being able to, uh, to do facial coding, especially these, these micro expressions, is that it gives us potentially a very affordable neuroscience measurement that's applicable to a wide range of studies. And there are a number of potential benefits. First, uh, LFAC is well documented, it's well researched, it's been you know worked on for over a hundred years so there's a lot more work that's been done in facial coding than almost any other neuroscience measure. It can be used for virtually any online study and, but it can also be used for in-person studies where you can put a computer screen in front of, of a respondent. It works with any device that has a front-facing camera. So it could be a PC a monitor with a camera, a laptop with a camera, a tablet with a camera, a smartphone, and so forth. One of the great advantages of LFAC is that it's culture and language neutral. So it's idea, ideal for multi-country studies where you have cultural differences and language differences. It's very, very difficult to get apples to apples comparison across countries. But LFAC gives us a tool to accomplish that. And another great advantage of uh, LFAC is that it provides a continuous moment-by-moment -moment, uh, reading of stimuli or reading of reactions to stimuli. So it gives us diagnostics second-by-second second as uh, people watch a commercial or as they listen to a soundtrack or, in our case, look at static images. But one, one big caveat, uh, there's always a danger that unless you do a large number of interviews, you may not have enough readable surveys to do an adequate analysis. You know, if a participant uh, moves their face around too much, it can disrupt uh, the read of their facial expressions. Uh, you know, if the participant is looking off or distracted by something else going on in the room, that can interrupt. Uh, some people won't permit their faces to be uh, uh, recorded and coded. So out of a typical survey, online survey, say of 200 completed surveys, typically you would only get 30 to 50 
LFAC recordings that are accurate and fully usable. But generally, we only need 30 to 35 completed cases or recordings to give statistically stable results. So that's not really a major limitation. So now to the wild animal experiment. Uh, this was a nationwide study in which we showed photos online of wild animals to 822 adults across the U.S. It was a nationally representative sample balanced by gender, age, and geographic distribution. Uh, as I mentioned, Effectiva provided the facial microcoding services, um, and decision analysts uh, did all of the uh, sampling, the recruiting, the programming, the hosting. Uh, Dr. Grant uh, uh, helped with the design and the experimental design was hers. Very clever, I might add, by the way. Uh, then the survey was conducted online using the American Consumer Opinion Panel, which is a source of extremely high quality sample. And not only did we measure the LFAC uh, responses of respondents, we followed that with a separate survey uh, right afterwards where we measured self-report emotional reactions to the same or a subset of those photos and we'll report on that in in a moment. So I'm going to turn it over uh, now to uh, Dr. Grant to talk a little bit about the experimental design that uh, for the study. Thank you very much Jerry. Thank you everyone for joining us today and learning about our wild animal study. I'm going to talk for a moment about our overall goals we wanted to use a set of photos that could elicit a variety of emotions at a variety of intensities. We then wanted to analyze those responses using the FAC with Affectiva's AFDEX measurement system. And then finally, we wanted to establish analytic tools to enable economical testing of large numbers of images. We included 35 photos of wild animals in a variety of natural studies. These were carefully selected. <laughs> and the study has a, a factorial design. A factorial design enables us to have a variety of wild animal categories that can represent five different content areas. So we have seven categories of animals, we have five categories of content. The participants saw each photo for exactly three seconds and the photos were separated by a half second blank screen. To explain a little more about this factorial design, here are our seven categories of wild animals. We have birds, reptiles, primates, big cats, pachyderms, bears, and a miscellaneous wild category. So these are all in portrait mode. So this is the content of these photos is all portrait. So we have seven portrait pictures. Now this is an example of our different kinds of content. As you can see at the top is that eagle we just saw as the portrait bird. We have the rest of these are birds, but they have the different content. The second one is this vulture with a full body. Bonding, which is a mother and child in an affectionate relationship. Uh, family, which is a mother and child uh, looking straight at the camera without any interaction. And romance, which is two consenting adults in a tender moment. Here's all 35 of the animals. We have birds, reptiles, primates, big cats, pachyderms, bears, and miscellaneous wild across the top. And we see down the column is portrait, full body, bonding, family, romance. So we end up having seven photographs for each content area. And that's where we're going to be focusing on the nature of emotional response that we elicited. 
Now, you may be wondering at this point, why in the world did marketing researchers choose wild animals to study? But wait, don't hang up. We have reasons. We needed to simplify the neuroprocessing demands. We didn't want to put other kinds of things in here where you'd have things that would distract from the animals. So we wanted to isolate emotional responses from cognitive overlays to the extent possible. The wild animals in our study meet five requirements that for photo generating intri intrinsic emotional reactions. First, they're inherently engaging. Wild animals run the gambit from endearing to terrifying. Second, they're flexible in their emotional content. We can find photos of different, with different shots and interactions between pairs. Third, they're familiar without, without giving any uh, identification. Our participants would know, you know, they may not know the exact name of the animal, telling the difference between an African elephant and an Indian elephant, but they know pretty much what kind of animal they're looking at without our having to use words or graphics. These are impersonal. They're not farm animals or common pets, which are highly likely to evoke personal attachments. Um, they're unfettered. They have limited marketing or purchase history. Uh, and we're able to have an emotional self-awareness or a common sense on which ones are nicer than the other ones. So we're not going to be thinking that the eagle is the nicest, prettiest, sweetest animal in the bunch. Um, so we have an, a, a real common sense way of evaluating the validity of these. But we are market researchers, and this is a study of emotional response, so we had to take a look at self-report. Jerry? So before we get into the uh, core of the presentation that uh, Dr. Grant will uh, deliver, uh, the study, just as a reminder, uh, at first each person uh, went through one by one and saw 35 photos of wild animals and we measured LFA-C as they looked at those pictures. Then we took a subset, 25 out of the 35 photos, and we had the respondents go through those photos and for each photo the question would be, looking at this photo, do you feel surprise? Looking at this photo, do you feel joy? And so forth. So it was a way to get a self-report measure of the same things that are being measured by LFAC to see what degree there is agreement or overlap. And these, think of these as directional or approximate numbers. There are many different ways that this, uh, these two data sets could be compared. Uh, but what we found uh, is that when we had a positive signal on surprise in the LFAC measurement, about 44% of the time we got the same measure in the self-report. So that is 44% of the time, the two different measures were in directionally in agreement. Uh, for the emotion of joy, that overlap or agreement was 51%. For fear, 56%. And disgust, 54%. So there are many different ways you could interpret this uh, agreement. Uh, but based on other work that we have done and, and Dr. Grant has done, we feel that the, the best way to interpret this is that self-report is perhaps getting at about half of, of all of the emotion that is being evoked by a particular stimulus. And so if that's true, then, then LFAC is giving us the 100% of the pure emotion. Because when we start asking questions about it, then there's a cognitive overlay that uh, Dr. Grant mentioned 
you know, we have to think about how we reacted to something, and that begins to interfere with the accuracy of our reporting or the honesty of our reporting. So we, we believe that LFAC, because it's based on those micro expressions that are being driven by the autonomic nervous system, is giving us a more pure measure of emotion than self-report is. But now to the main event and Dr. Grant's uh, summary of the findings. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, I'm gonna start by talking about valence. Um, valence is the intrinsic attractiveness of the photo. So uh, the positive responses reflect the goodness of the animal, the response of, you know, I'm I'm having a very positive emotional response to this animal. The negative ones are obviously the badness of the animal. This is an unpleasant animal. I'm having a very negative response to it. So I'm looking at, for, for the, these data that I'm presenting here, I'm looking at rank order. So we start off with the number one best, most well-liked photo is the rhesus monkey. Now, it's not surprising that the rhesus monkey is the first because it is very human-like. In much of the brain area is devoted to processing facial information. We recognize people, we interpret their facial uh, expressions, we have to produce our own facial expressions, and this is very demanding of the brain's uh, resources. Now, one of the studies that has been done with the imaging um, equipment that, you know, like MRI, those kinds of imaging equipment, showed the difference between human faces and animal faces. And human faces have about twice the activity in the areas critical to faces as animal faces. But animal faces have two and a half times the activity of full bodies. So as you can see, our vulture here, which had the lowest rank, is a full body photo. So our, our findings here are consistent with those findings. But the question comes up, we're all primates in this, you know, we're with the monkeys, we're cousins, and how close, you know, how close is that primate face to a human face? So we now have all kinds of ways of manipulating human faces. We have a lip injection, a bit of Botox, targeted plastic surgery, facial hair waxing, a colorist, light contact lenses, and a great makeup artist. Now what if we apply these to our rhesus monkey? Now, she's not real pretty, but you can see that this is a distinctly human face. So really with our rhesus monkeys, they're, they're probably, this kind of a picture is probably being processed very close to how we would process a human face. So here are the highest ranked animals. There's seven here. Of course, the rhesus monkey is first. Then we have two uh, photos that are, represent the romance content. Here we have the iguanas having a, a totally charming little arm around romantic watching of the sunset. Here we have here we have chimpanzees having that little facial touch between close friends, shall we say. Then we have four uh, bonding photos: the white tigers, the hippos, the koalas, and the ducks. Now we have the lowest ranking animals. So these are the ones that had the most negative valence response. So of course we're back to the, the vulture and working up the ranking, the next, the, so that was the 35th. The 34th was this antelope. Now the brain does not like long, sharp things that might hurt you. So that's one of the reasons why the brain would not like this antelope. But the other is, if you look at the face, you know, one of the things all animals have in common is two ears, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And when there's any kind of distortion in 
that kind of composition, it's very troubling to the brain, which does have some, some applications to what kind of advertising you do. Don't mess with a face. Um, so that's one of the reasons they may not, another reason why they may not have liked that antelope. The alligator, well, I think that goes without saying why they didn't like that. The uh, rhinoceros, once again, we have a horn. And then the eagle, while we have many positive images of eagles in our mind uh, as the United States bird, this one is not one of those friendly images. It's a uh, um, I didn't realize how powerful their shoulders are, although it's obvious they have to flap those big wings. Meerkats and then panthers. So now we want to look at, compare what we've found here. So in this study, we have a, a, a validation that is unique to this kind of study. We can use our common sense to validate the findings. It, it doesn't really take doing much more than looking at the ones that people liked versus the ones they didn't like to say, yep, they only saw these pictures for three seconds, just three seconds each, and we can tell which ones they liked and which ones they didn't like. So looking at 35 photos for three seconds each and being able to do this level of emotional uh, identification is a pretty impressive thing. We've got a very good measurement system here with facial action coding. Now I'd like to talk about the difference between portrait and full body uh, content. Now I also already mentioned the imaging study that says with portraits, we animal portraits, we have two and a half times the activation is with full bodies. So with the full bodies here, you know, we've got, when we looked at the full bodies that did so badly, they were ugly and fearful and all that kind of stuff. You know, they were not pleasant. And maybe the only reason we got low scores for our full bodied animals was because that of that, you know, maybe if we had something that was really charming and wonderful as a full bodied photo, we would do better. So everybody loves a giant panda. I mean, they're one of the most popular animals around. The World Wildlife Fund has that as their logo. Um, there's little stuffed animals and little costumes. I mean, they, they are really out there being um, the kinds of things we wanted to avoid being advertised and promoted. But did they do better? Well, not so much. A rank of 16 isn't very impressive. So probably we are seeing the effect that was found in those imaging studies that the faces are, are far more uh, activating of brain than are the full bodies. So we have 17.4 for the um, mean rank for the portraits, whereas we have a, a floor of 29.1 for the full bodies. Bonding is probably the most important relationship we'll ever have. It is the time when a child forms an attachment to a parent. In the cases here, I'll refer to a mother. Uh, it has a number of characteristics. When in a bonding situation, a child desires to be near mom. The child feels safe and comfortable when they are with mom. The child is, is uh, courageous and will explore the environment when mom is nearby. And a child is nervous and scared when mom goes away. And we've all seen these kind of, kinds of behaviors in children. So what happens when baby grows up? So now we're looking at what happens. Now, um, research has shown that having a good attachment bonding as a child leads to success in all forms and having interrelations and having uh, good performance in school, good performance on jobs and having a successful marriage and being a good parent, all kinds of good things. So I'd like to imagine just what are these babies going to say about their bonding experiences with their mother. Now the white tigers rank four. Mom always got me to school and lessons on time. The hippos, when times got tough, 
I could always lean on my mom. The koalas? Mom and I were the best of friends. She never went anywhere without me. And those ducks. It was always smooth sailing with mom. Romance. Uh, bonding was, by the way, our most popular, the highest ranking mean rank of 11.1. Romance is, uh, we, it had two very high uh, scoring photos. One was the iguanas and the other the chimpanzees. But then it plunges down and, and it gets to a mean of just 16.4. So what happens between those high ranking ones and the next ones? Well, you know, the first two are very human interactions of romance. We can relate to putting an arm around our, our significant other and, and touching their face. We probably can't relate very much to crossing beaks or intertwining our trunks. So I think we've got uh, how human-like having a big effect here. Now our final one is family, and the family photos are, uh, they're facing the camera, just the way our portraits were, and there's no interaction, so that's how they differ from our bonding ones. So there, there's no interaction between the parent and child, and, there's, and they're looking straight at the camera. Now you can see that the mere presence of the child improves the performance of the photos because family had a mean rank of 14.9 versus portrait was 17.4. So one of the things that does suggest is that uh, if you're doing you know baby ads for some reason you might want to put mom there too that there's there's uh, something in those relationships we've seen that all of the relationships were doing better than either the portrait or the full body so uh, since relationships are so important to us that's probably a good choice to make jerry take so it away. Uh, so in conclusion there's several things that i think we can draw from this study at this point and um, we still have a lot of analytical work to do on the results, but uh, so think of these as preliminary findings. But first, and I think most importantly, uh, face, facial action coding appears to be a valid way to measure emotional responses in human beings. Uh, there's kind of common sense validation, as you can see in the results that uh, Dr. Grant presented. Um, we know from our own work here at Decision Analyst that LFAC can be applied to virtually any online survey that has a camera in the PC monitor, the laptop, smartphone, etc. And thirdly, uh, facial coding is really ideal for measuring and diagnosing things that are in motion. Uh, uh, you know, a commercial, a 30-second commercial, a 60-second commercial. So you can look at what's going on and diagnose what's going on second by second in that commercial or that soundtrack. So this ability to track things moment by moment is really, uh, really important. Um, and, and lastly, it's our conclusion, others might draw a different conclusion, but it's our conclusion that facial coding or facial action coding appears to more fully measure the pure emotional responses that are coming from our unconscious and from the autonomic uh, nervous system than any type of self-report question does. So, and, and again, it goes back to these micro expressions that can be captured in LFAC that we as humans are not fully aware of. Just very quickly, uh, LFAC can be applied both to qualitative research and quantitative research. And the controlling idea is that any time you need reaction to a stimuli or a stimulus, LFAC can add value and add diagnostics to what's really 
going on. So in quantitative research, pre-testing advertising, uh, commercials, radio, television, pre-testing print ads, packages, taglines, brand names, um, car models and styles, exteriors, movie trailers. So any study involving any type of reactions to a stimulus is ideal for LFAC. It can even be used in qualitative research, especially online qualitative. It can give you an instantaneous read on what's going on, and then you can then pursue and follow up with, uh, with questions. So speaking we, of following up with questions, <laughs> I got one. I'm so Sharon out there. I'm so glad you asked. Her question is: Is there a reason you structured the order of presentation of the stimuli in a fixed order versus randomized order? Would that not possibly factor in a bias when not randomized? Well, Sharon, we had two orders. First, we randomized one with a couple of restrictions, like you know, not too many of the same type. And then we did the exact reverse as a second order. And what we were, what we were trying to determine here is uh, how can we, what can we do so that we can effectively and financially reachable do a lot of stimuli and not have order effects. Now we've all been you know, having trouble dealing with order effects over the years. But on this case, what the important thing there is that they saw three seconds of each animal, and then there was a half second of blank screen. So what we did was we calibrated the responses by using the mean of the inner stimulus interval, that black screen, and re subtracted that from the responses to the uh, wild animal. Now what happened when we did this, before we, before we do the calibration, there's a huge uh, correlation between order and attention. Not surprising. After we calibrated, that goes away. There was uh, a, core, a strong correlation between the same animals that was a strong, you know, so the wild animal that was first and the wild animal that was last, which is the same, you know, in the second group, those are the same wild animals. Those were highly correlated to each other, even though they were in different orders. And then also the order effect was not related to valence or to other, other att attention, you know, so basically the calibration worked very well and we believe what we can do with that is we can find a way here to use, uh, to be able to present a much larger set of visual stimuli without having to worry about the added expense of trying to do all these rotations which ends up having to be more groups and more difficulties. So another question uh, that's come in, uh, A.T., uh, could you talk more about exactly what valence is? Well, valence is a combination of a, of a couple of things. So what we d um, in the facial micro movements, when uh, FAC is processing the data, they look at different areas of the face, face and, uh, and where it is relative to other spots on the face. So like, you know, the eyes and the distance in the eyes gives them lots of information about uh, the locations. So a cheek raise is a very positive facial gesture and it goes nicely with a smile, especially for those of us with big cheeks. Um, so that's a very positive kind of thing, and that would contribute in a positive way to valence. Now, I'm going to say these slowly so you can try them out for yourself. Here are some negative things. Brow furrow, nose wrinkles, chin raise, lip corner depress, and lips pressed together. Those are all negative things. So those would lower the valence scores. So valence is an overall net measure of positive reaction? Yes. Great, great. Um, 
What, what are the implications uh, of these study results for creating effective ads? Well, in terms of TVCs, television commercials, it's the most amazing thing I've ever dealt with. You get, um, you can look second by second. I mean, we actually get uh, a measurement every 14th of a second. So over, over three seconds, we would have 42 measurements. And when you're looking at a TV commercial, it's 60 seconds or 30 seconds. So you can actually see like, what's the effect of a scene change? What's the effect of the, the audio? What's the effect of uh, branding? What, uh, what are the, what's the reaction before the brand is identified and what's the reaction after? What, what parts of the TV commercial increase uh, valence? What parts of the commercial decrease it? Uh, is there a particular character that uh, comes in that is positively responded to? Is there a storyline in it that is more positive? You can tell whether the, it, one of the things that the brain likes is to know where it's supposed to be looking. So when you're doing those scene changes, sometimes you move the focal point and you can see whether that's having a de detrimental effect. So ad agencies can be given very, very helpful information to fine tune ads. So it's one of the best applications I've seen is starting with a 60 second ad. How do you make a 30 second ad out of that that has the most power? Very good uh, answer. One, one final thing and we're almost out of time. Uh, what about validation? Uh, you, you know, how does, is, is LFAC validated and uh, I've heard discussion of validation studies uh, separate from this study which yes. had some common sense validation. Yes, there have been a number of studies that have uh, gone validating these kinds of things that are in the literature. Um, Affectiva has run over 5,300,000 faces over the time. Um, this technique has been integrated into uh, standard TVC testing by some very major marketing research firms. And one of the other ways that shows the importance of this kind of work is how it's been used in other areas. Uh, it is used, and I'm going to like list a few of the things where it's used in, in clinical applications. Uh, it's used in the assessment of occurrence and intensity of pain. This is a problem, especially with the critically ill and with children. So by, by analyzing the facial responses, they can tell about the pain, the quantity and type of pain. Uh, detection and monitoring of depression, the impact on others in the family, and childhood risk for depression. Effects of alcohol on emotion and social bonding. Diagnosis and treatment of autism, nonverbal human and computer interaction, and cleft palates, of course. Our, uh, our time is up. Thank you so very much for joining our webinar today. If you have follow-up questions, feel free to contact uh, Dr. Grant or uh, me directly, and we will respond uh, very quickly to your questions and your answers. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending today's Insider Series webinar and, and again if you have any questions feel free to email either AT or Jerry. Um, there were a couple questions submitted that have not been answered so um, we will get to those as soon as we can within the next couple of days. Our next Insider Series webinar will be Wednesday, July 19th. Decision analyst John Colius and Elizabeth Horn will be presenting pricing analytics. We hope you enjoyed today's session and are looking forward to seeing you for next month's webinar. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.